Good morning, Shady Grove Church. It's uh, good to have this opportunity to uh, bring Sunday School to you live this morning. Uh, please don't forget this is Memorial Day, and uh, we're still having church today. It's drive-in. Uh, we will give you an op have an opportunity if you want to walk out to the cemetery after service. Uh, the pastor has something prepared for our uh, time out there, so uh, that's all available. Otherwise, we'll stay in our cars as normal. And when you're out, please remember social distancing. But we hope to see you here at 1030. Today we are uh, talking about serving. A uh, friend of mine, good Christian fellow that uh, I, I like dearly, and we were having a chat one day, and he said, Randy, have you ever taken a uh, spiritual gift survey? And I said, yeah. I said, let me guess. Yours was servitude or servitude. He said, advice. I said, yeah, I know, <laughs> but you know, we have a place to be. Uh, people like to, to read me a lot because I'm usually in the kitchen when there's something going on here at church, but I feel that's my place to be, my place to serve, and that's what we're going to look at today. Seize the opportunity to serve, and we will be in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, and then we'll jump over to chapter 6 and look at 1 through 5 and verse 10. Uh, before we begin, let's have a short word of prayer. To the kind of gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity to stand before uh, our folks today and to bring your word and uh, that you'll bless my efforts, that it will be your words and not my words, and the honor and glory will go to you all in Christ's name. Amen. Um, if you were here, I would be asking you a question. It says, when have you received stellar service? Uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, handyman, I guess you might say, activities, uh, big jobs, little jobs, whatever. And I do like to get paid because that's the whole idea of doing them. But I've told a lot of people that uh, uh, when they say, you know, I really appreciate the job you've done, that uh, means a lot. Uh, doesn't quite be getting paid, but it sure means a lot. And I do appreciate it when folks appreciate the work I do because I want to do the best I can. Um, we've all had experiences with customer service we'd like to forget. Uh, but the author says, I tend to remember the ones that make me smile rather than frown. For example, a man booked a last-minute trip on a well-known airline to see his dying grandson one last time. Traffic and long lines at the airport caused him to arrive at the gate 10 minutes after the plane's scheduled departure. But the airline had been informed of this man's tragic situation. Imagine a man surprised when the pilot himself was standing there waiting for him. The pilot said, they can't go anywhere without me, and I wasn't going anywhere without you. I am sorry for your loss. The pilot exhibited good customer service. Um, I've just had a few things lately with social distancing and everything else, but... Uh, I am not saying where, how, or what, but I did a drive-through to pick up an item for my wife, and she usually picks up this item, and I said, uh, is it always that loving and sweet when you go through it? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, um, I got snorted at, I got looked at like I was inconvenienced, and the lady, and uh, I just said, it didn't feel very welcome, and she said, it's like that. I said, okay, uh, not my idea of customer service. But anyway, good customer service is not about making a sale or even keeping a customer. It's about doing what's right and helping the other person. But we're not talking about customers and business. We're talking about relationships. The principle still applies though. We strengthen our relationships when we help and serve the other person. Serving is a tangible way to love others. The title of today's lesson is really Seize the Opportunity to Serve. I have a different title for this lesson. I think it should be titled, Love to Serve. Not serve to love, but love to serve. And I do love to serve. Now, I'll tell folks when we're getting ready to do a chicken pie dinner or when we're getting ready to do a barbecue and I try to get everybody together and when we pray over it and I say, now, before I make somebody mad, I'm gonna go ahead and apologize up front, but I get a little stressed, a little tense, want to see everything to go well, uh, like to see everybody working together and having a good time. So if I'm not real pleasant, I'll apologize now and then I'll probably apologize later, but that just goes along with it. 
Let's begin in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 15. For you were called to be free, brother and sister. I do like the Christian Standard translation here because I really believe that Paul uh, loved the brothers and sisters in Galatia. And it says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom, and other translations call it liberty. Don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Verse 13, a few highlights here we want to look at. Paul began this section of the letter by reminding the Galatian believers they were called to be free. He used two terms here to set the limits for Christian life. The first term is called. Uh, I was an educator for 30 years. And if there's a parallel here, and I think there is, like I believe Brother Stephen is called to be our pastor and to bring God's word. I think educators, and I know a lot of you are educators, it's nice to be in the church of educators and folks that may be watching online that are. But if you're not called, you're in the wrong profession. Uh, in my later years, I guess I got a little bit cantankerous in my challenging people. And we'd start a new year and we'd have somebody come in with no teacher education experience. And if it came out of the mouth once, it came out of the mouth more than one time. And it just, it hurt. I thought I would give education a try. So whenever we had a private moment, I'd say, is that green Ford Taurus out back yours? And they say, yes, Mr. Evans, that's mine. I said, good. Let me help you put your boxes back in there. And they go, what? I said, look, let me tell you something real quick. If you're going to try education, and you're going to try to teach these seventh graders, and then I get them as eighth graders, you're not going to make my job very good because I'm going to have to reteach what you didn't teach. So if your heart's not in it, if you cannot see yourself doing anything else but this, that's okay. But if not, I'll help you pack up. It wasn't very nice, I know, but you got to be called. you got to be called to what you're doing. You can't, people know if you're trying to pretend. If you're trying to make it up, it don't work that way. So you are called to be free. And again, we are called, by which Paul meant God, God's call of a person to become a Christian. We often hear the word uh, with reference to uh, the Christian vocation, but that's not what we're really talking about. Paul did not write the Galatian preachers. He wrote to all those in the churches of Galatia. If God is one who calls us to faith in Christ, then only God has the right to defend the Christian, or excuse me, to define the Christian life. So you're called as a Christian, and as a Christian, you're supposed to love. That's just it. You try to figure it out. If you're not loving, you're not very Christian. I'm not saying we have a good day every day. We have bad days. And there's people that are hard to love. I'll be the first to admit that. I may be one of them. But, uh, we're supposed to try. Second, we're free. The term is free. But freedom is not some liberty uh, or libertine understanding of Christianity. Rather, Paul was emphasizing that Christians are free from slavery of the Old Testament law and to legalism. This freedom is not to be abused, nor is it a license for believers to sin. Paul knew all too well that some Christians misuse their freedom, what he described as an opportunity of, for the flesh. And Unfortunately, we, we, we know folks, and, and I'm not going to talk about denominations or what else, but we know that some denominations are a little more lax in what they expect of folks. And, and as Christians, you know, what's, what do you do? You go to church on Sunday and live like the world Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday? Or do you try to live for the Lord every day? And that's, that's you know, we got to serve through love. Uh, we easily miss the paradox that Paul intended if we only read the English translation. But it's impossible to ignore the original Greek text. The word translated serve, the Greek verb is D-O-U-L-E-U-E-T, and I'm not going to begin to pronounce it, but it means to be owned by another or to be a slave. Plain and simple. When I read this, I have an image of Christ. The night before his crucifixion. He finished dinner and he got up and he took off his outer garments, tied something around his waist, got a basin of water and a towel and he went around and washed the disciples' feet. Now for you and I, 
We don't know what that means. But for people that lived walking in the dirt, walking everywhere they went, wearing sandals on their feet, there was nothing greater than to have your feet washed. That's love. That's serving. And that's Christ's example. And that's what we should be looking at. And I think I lost my place. But anyway, while Paul asserted the freedom for the Galatian Christians, he followed up immediately with the call to use their freedom in slavery to one another. Set free from self. They were now free from enslavement to one another through love. For Paul, faith and freedom have an undeniable obligation to love and serve others. The practice of self-giving love acts as an antidote to the power of the flesh. Verse 14, and I'm going to uh, read that again. It says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbors as yourself. After commanding the Galatians to serve one another, Paul then noted the whole law is fulfilled in the single command to love neighbors, to love our neighbors. Up to this point in Galatians, Paul had spoken negatively of the law. He decided that no person can be justified by the law. He spoke of dying to the law and as well as the curse of the law, and that it represented the old era of slavery in contrast to the new era of salvation. Uh, the, the law as it was, the basic Ten Commandments, and then as uh, the, 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 the priests add more laws and add more laws and amendments to laws, and they just got more and more and more and more and more, and after a while, you just couldn't keep up with all of them, much less satisfy all of them, and he said, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Do what's right. Love, you, you know, love God first and love your neighbor. That's it. Plain and simple. If you do all that, you've got enough to do. Much less keeping up with the, you got to, wait a minute, how was it? You had to carry a meal as far as you could walk on Saturday and come back home so on Sunday when you traveled, you could pick it up on the way and not be trapped and not be working or something like that. But for the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Leviticus 19.18, we're looking at it as a way to fulfill the law. Paul, uh, Paul followed the pattern of Jesus. In response to the question of a scribe about the greatest commandment, Jesus first cited uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he added 19.18. The second is love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no greater commandment than these. That's Mark 12, 30 and 31. The point seems to be that the way to fulfill the law is not according to the flesh, that is, by getting circumcised, but by fulfilling the intent of the law by loving one another through the power of the Spirit. Paul's agitators in Galatia expressed grave concern that he had dismissed the significance of fulfilling the law. Paul responded that if believers are really interested in fulfilling the law, then they are to walk in love for others. The intent of the law was to create one people one family bound together by love of God and love of one another. In verse 15, it says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Concern for the interest of other believers builds up the church. But conflict in its ranks inevitably breaks down those efforts. In verse 15, Paul warned the Galatians uh, believers that if you bite and devour one another, watch out. You will be consumed by one another. The term for bite was used to describe the attack of the snake. So that's a pretty vicious thing if you've ever watched a snake uh, uh, strike. The term for devour spoke of animals such as wild dogs that devour their prey. Consuming one another is spiteful discord. Believers remained oblivious to the weakening of their own lives. But the destruction of fellowship, excuse me, weaken their lives, the destruction of the fellowship, and the loss of their witness to the world already infected with pandemic sinfulness. So, you got to love your neighbor. You can't be backbiting, you can't be talking, you can't be putting them down. Uh, I may be the world's worst, but it's not. That's just not. Uh, summarizing what we've covered here, we're called to be free in Christ. The Emancipation Proclamation has been issued. We are free, but free to do what? 
We are free to love your neighbor as yourself. Think about the ways you naturally serve yourself. When your body needs food, you make haste to the fridge. When your body calls out for sleep, you go in search of a pillow and a blanket. I go in search of my recliner. When your body feels the need for exercise, you take the dog for a walk. This type of self-service is not necessarily bad, but Paul challenged us to serve others just as we serve ourselves. We serve our needs. Likewise, we can serve others when they have needs. Make everyday investments in others until it becomes a natural way of doing your life. Moving on to uh, verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Again, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. That verse is loaded. It's loaded. Let me read it one more time. See if I can break it down a little bit. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in wrongdoing, signaling that They've been caught in some sort of an act. Okay? You who are spiritual, you who are saved, you who are Christians, should restore this person with a gentle spirit. And I'll swallow real hard right there. It's, it's, it's so easy. It's so easy to say the wrong thing and have the wrong attitude. That gentle spirit means that we got to love. we got to love on them. Not, not put them down. We've got to pick them up. We've got to love on them. Watching out for yourself so that you're not tempted. I can tell the story of an individual I know that for years was in alcohol and drugs. And uh, got right with the Lord. Got in church. Doing the right thing. doing Going to the right places. And at some point after about a seven year period decided that the people that he used to be with is who he needed to try to help. And he ended up right back where he started from. We have to be careful. Not to say we can't love them. Uh, love to tell the people to kill them with kindness. But killing them with kindness doesn't mean that we have to accept their ways and be part of their ways. Verse 2 says, Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone, verse 3, if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. In verse 4, let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone. You can stop right there. Take pride in yourself alone. And not compare himself to someone else. I am so much better than that person. I don't do what they do. I don't go where they go. I don't say what they say. Mm -hmm. Keep it to yourself. For each person, verse 5, for each person will have to carry his own load. All right. Hitting the highlights here. Verse 1, uh, he's given the example of a person who was overtaken in wrongdoing. This could mean uh, discovering, uh, discovered in the act of sinning and whatever. Okay. Paul asserted that those who were spirit-filled, Christians, have a responsibility to restore that person. But man, if you don't know what they did, don't know what they did, but I know what it says we have to do. If you can't do it, then be sure that you will support somebody that is willing to do it. Don't hinder somebody else. That, I, I understand you can't go confront this person. I mean, there's hurt that goes deep. So, do the next best thing. Find somebody that will go in your place and support that person. Pray for that person. And hopefully, eventually, you will be able to make amends with that person as well. The restoration has to be done with a gentle spirit rather than with harsh, judgmental attitude. You don't fix and you just, you know. Paul had listed gentleness as the eighth virtue in his description of the fruit of the spirit. And it's not surprising he would insist that the work of restoration should be carried out with gentleness. He warned the Galatians, he said, watching out for yourselves so that you won't be tempted. The danger exists that those seeking to restore another person would either, number one, fall into the same wrongdoing, or number two, uh, uh, excuse me, congratulate themselves for their sinlessness, arrogance, and attitude. 
Look how great I am. Look how good I am. Look what I have done. No. Verse 2. Not only were the spiritually or mature Christians responsible to restore fellow believers, they were also responsible to carry another's burden. The word burden refers to loads too heavy to bear alone. Why are you doing why are you trying to help that person? They don't go to church with us. They don't support the church. They don't do this. They don't do this. They do do this. They do do that. And they're not going to get any better if we don't try to help them. If we don't try to set the example they need. And do it again, as we see later, without looking for uh, gratitude for what you're doing. The kind of uh, burden-bearing uh, fulfilled the law of Christ. The apostles spent most of the letter arguing that the Galatians were free for the works of the, from the works of the law, and his reference to the law of Christ offered a reminder that commitment to Christ does not mean freedom from responsibility. Go ahead and say amen, brother. Okay. And the law of Christ, excuse me, the law of Christ was perhaps shorthand for Jesus' teaching that the whole law could be summed up in that one commandment. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Certainly the work of restoration and burden bearing often, excuse me, offer fitting examples of what love for neighbors might look like in a church. You've got to be willing to go. And sometimes you've got to be willing to go without being invited to go. That's tough, I know. Verse 3. In verses 3, 4, and 5, Paul warns against pride and arrogance and the trait most likely to derail your act of love. You know, you're just doing so good. You're just doing so good. And you're working and reaching and spending time and doing whatever you got to do. And then it just takes one little slip up, one little open up that thing they call the mouth. Or one little, look what I did, patting yourself on the back. And that's not what it's all about. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Believers are not to consider themselves to be superior to others. Elevating themselves and putting others down would prevent them from restoring erring believers and helping shoulder other loads. To believe one is superior to others not only cuts off from bearing the burden of others, it also means one fails to recognize or his or her need for help in carrying the burden as well. Verse 4, Paul had clearly established that the spirit-filled believers must take responsibility for others. But it's also true that a spirit-filled person should take responsibility for himself or herself. Let each person, and I underline this several times, let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. The flesh distorts any attempt to make an honest assessment of ourselves. Self-deception and pride go hand in hand as twin agents of the flesh. The fleshly tendency is to select others with whom we love faith. Now you've got to be careful on that one. You know, I look better than so and so. I just so much want somebody to come back and say, yeah, but you're not near as good as that one over there. So you got, you know, it just don't work. It just don't work. Uh, the Greek word translated exam or examine generally means to put something to the test or make a close examination of something. Verse 5, for each person will have to carry his own load. How is this verse to be interpreted in the light of Paul's call in verse 2 that believers are to carry one another's load? To begin, Paul used one, and there we go, Greek word for burdens in, in verse 2, and a different one for load. The word load in verse 5 carries the meaning of a weight that a person can and must carry alone. Don't necessarily understand that, but you've got to carry it by yourself. It's yours and yours alone. In writing that each person must carry his or her own load, Paul called on believers to take responsibility for themselves before God. There's things that you have to answer for, I guess. And so you've got to carry them. Somebody else can't carry them for you. You've got to carry them. Dale was a, a driven guy, an achiever, and a self-starter. Unfortunately, as Dale built his reputation in the marketplace, he destroyed his reputation with his family and his friends. 
We're thankful. Responsibility that believers have to the brothers and sisters who have messed up. We've got to be gentle. We've got to reach out. Paul wrote home the need for tangible forms of service. He says, carry one another's burdens in this way and you will fulfill the law of Christ. Strong relationships call for us to help carry loads. It's still my load to carry, but by coming alongside and helping me carry it, you ease my strain. In a sense, my burden becomes your burden as we carry it together. Sometimes that's all it takes. It's just another hand. And that load is just different. Where did the, where did, where did the burden go? You know, we still got to carry it, but where did that burden go? You've moved heavy things, but just one more person is like, oh, no big thing. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. First time I, I've read this verse before, but the first time it really sunk in was a slight. Paul was saying we've got to take care of our Christian family, our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. But I thought we were supposed to take care of folks that didn't know Christ. I thought we were supposed to be reaching out to the unchurched and the lost. We are. But don't forget to take care of the ones that we are family with, so to speak. Verses 7 and 8, Paul had reminded the audience that we reap what we sow. And those who sow in the flesh reap destruction or eternal damnation. Those who sow in the spirit reap eternal life. Those are only the only two options. We either turn to God, placing our faith in Christ for forgiveness of our sins, or we reject God's offer of salvation through Jesus Christ and remain in our sins. Paul then exhorted the Galatian believers not to tire of doing good. The reason for this was that at the proper time, they would reap a harvest. That same, uh, the same is true for believers today. In time, the good we do will bear fruit. Instead of waiting around idly for the harvest to come, we are to keep on looking for opportunities to serve. I prayed for things that I didn't think were ever going to be answered, things that I didn't think were ever going to happen. So if it's not in God's time for it to happen right now, what do I do? Sit on my hands? Crawl under a tree somewhere and take a nap. No, I gotta keep going. I gotta keep going. Keep praying for it. God's got a time for it. Have faith. Trust in the Lord. But you gotta move on. You gotta keep going. Keep on looking for opportunities to serve. Paul instructed Christians to take advantage of every opportunity to work for the good of all. Opportunity translates the Greek word of K A I R O S, Kairos, a special time given by God as an opportunity to do His will and making this appeal, Paul assumed God would provide believers opportunities for doing good. We are to be alert to them. Look for them. They're there. We've got to look for them. Sometimes we ignore them. Don't ignore them. Um, the Greek term for good in verse 10 differs from the one in verse 9, but both words probably suggest outward deeds of kindness. I think of uh, the movie where they were talking about Acts of random kindness, A R K, like ark. Random acts of kindness, whichever way you say it. Uh, I know uh, we were on a mission trip to New York City, and uh, one of our team members uh, got sick, and uh, it was lunchtime. We it was Sunday after lunch church, and another fellow and I had gone down to McDonald's from where we were staying, and we ate lunch, and we picked up this other brother a lunch. And we're walking down the street. Young lady, I say, in her mid twenties, sitting on the street, has a sign that says, "I don't mean to harm anyone. I only need help." And he and I took two steps past that lady, and we both froze. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I said, "You know what we got to do, don't you?" He said, "Yep." <laughs> and I said, "Me or you?" He said, "I got this." I said, "All right, I'll go get another lunch." And he sat down. And by the time I got back, he had been able to share one simple message. She was eating and she looked at him and she said, why are you doing this? And he said, it's all about God's love. He said, I've got to reach out and love my neighbor. 
and that was it. We got a shitter that much. We never saw her again. But at least we took the time to love a neighbor, to serve our neighbor, I guess is a good way to put it. Paul stated clearly that our love should be directed to all people everywhere. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, calls on us to reach out to lost people outside the church. Paul created every person, excuse me, God created every person, and he loves each one of them immensely. In his heart, he sent his son to die for each and every one of them. We love them regardless of how they respond to us. We do good to them by being kind to them, caring for them, praying for them, nurturing relationships with them, and sharing the gospel of Christ with them. Many of them may not respond to the gospel, but our love for them won't allow us to exclude them from hearing it. Kill them with kindness. Although all people without distinction are to be the recipients of Christian kindness, Paul noted that believers have a special responsibility to other Christians. Those who belong to the household of faith. In describing believers as the household of faith, Paul designated Christians as a single spiritual family. Instead of fighting and forming selfish fractions, and you can refer to Galatians 5.26, we are to build up this family by serving one another in love. Paul's teaching remains relevant today. We should extend kindness to everyone we meet, but especially to our spiritual family members. In summation, verse 7, For whatever a person shows, he will read, For this reason Christians are challenged to sow seeds in the forever fields of Christian community. Verse 10, Paul mentioned the need to demonstrate love to all, but he stressed the importance of Christians investing in other Christians. Relationships inside the church are held to the highest level. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Again, Paul said, work for the good of all. Our needs, as well as our gifts and abilities to serve and minister can vary, but each of us is equally called to work for the good of all. All that remains for us to do is to open our eyes and open our hearts to see the needs and go for it. Dear kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you for Paul's message and what you laid on his heart to the Galatians and help that same message go out to each and every one in the sound of my voice that we are to love each other, to care for each other, to serve each other, or as I like to say, we should love to serve. Be with us today as we continue to worship you in this time of Remembering those that have gone on ahead of us as we have this memorial time together. We just pray that you would bless us, lead us, guide us, direct us, and bless our time. In Christ's name we do.